How do we feel about this line out of context? But it stinks. Oh, get down there, you sissy. I've always liked an RPG on the go. Handhelds are perfect for that. Yeah, look at you, so lovely. They fit conveniently into the pocket of your favorite early 2000s style jean and terribly into the pocket of my now out of fashion skinny jean. Two screens on this one, I say, to lay eyes upon such a delight. I've said this before, but I think it bears repeating because my other videos are not required viewing. While most of the world's consoles were going through a transitional time, for my good friend the turn-based RPG, handhelds kept the torch burning. While the genre had to spend a little time doing some self-discovery in Generation 7, <laughs> You can't even tell the difference between a hologram and the real thing! You're a child, a baby, a fetus! <laughs> handhelds had the luxury of not needing to evolve very much. The limited hardware meant they could keep plugging away what they already knew worked. And you can do all that grinding on the go, which helped break the whole experience down into nice little chunks. For example, I think Dragon Quest VII works better as a 3DS game than a PlayStation game, thanks solely to the bite-sized nature of its stories. The other obvious thing helping handhelds along was cost. While consoles were going through their phase, getting their belly buttons pierced and figuring themselves out, the DS and PSP had no problem just handing me more of the same. It was during the tail end of this generation that the Nintendo DS had a bit of a cult classic title, Radiant Historia. And unlike some of its contemporaries, it got very high praise critically, perhaps thanks in part to its very unique beginnings. This is Satoshi Takayashiki. In 2005, Mr. Takayashiki, character designer Hiroshi Konichi, and another programmer all got together and decided to dedicate their free time to concepting a brand new game. They would bring with them a wide range of influences, including One Piece, Warhammer, and Ryoma Gayuku, a historical novel. In this interview, they mention it being a successor to Radiata Stories, but honestly, after playing, I don't think there's a lot of connective tissue left. There's some thematic similarities, but I wouldn't call it a successor in any real way. I mean, in the concept phases, the protagonist was planned to be a sword, so really a lot was on the table early on, I think. This began as a spare time project, however, something to fit in between regular work. Eventually, over the course of the next two years, the team would develop a whole world and a full working prototype of their battle system. When they brought a prototype of the game to Atlas, future director Mitsuru Hurata was impressed. In fact, impressed enough that I managed to get this cool documentary-style pull quote. When he first showed me the plans, the visuals in the world were already well-defined, and that was big. Those are some of the most difficult hurdles one faces when making an RPG. It takes a lot of time and costs a lot, too. So his presenting all that to me up front, it had a big impact on the project getting picked up. Thanks in part to all the hard work they had done over the years, the game was an easy shoe-in to get greenlit. And by 2010, Radiant Historia strode proudly into the world, right in time for the 3DS to drop a few months later and steal all the media attention. The sales didn't exactly set the world on fire, debuting at number 6 on Japan's charts, with only 32,000 units sold in its opening week. Sales aren't an indicator of quality, though, and Radiant Historia was a good game. One of those sorts of good games where it usually just comes up anytime someone talks about the best DS RPGs. Critically, it was well received. Nintendo Power gushed, calling it a quote, deluxe model role-playing game, whatever that means. The final product really stood out from the more simple storytelling handheld RPGs had a reputation for. This was a mature storyline with thoughtful characters for classy adults. You could think about the merits of having a 401k while grinding levels. You could enjoy the elegant notes of cherry, cranberry, raspberry, and cedar in a glass of La Guerre La Brunello di Monticino while advancing your dialogue. You could even ponder accessory buffs while scheduling your routine colonoscopy. You could do any number of classy adult things. You could... You could even eat that Dorito you just dropped on the floor. <laughs> no one's watching. You pay rent. You deserve that Dorito. Perhaps a testament to the game's solid foundation, Atlas decided to release a new edition, the perfect chronology, onto the 3DS in 2017. 
Again, like last time, the Japanese edition of Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology dropped about a month before we saw Breath of the Wild release, so there wasn't a lot of oxygen left in the room for the little RPG that could. Later, in 2018, the US would get the game as well, but at this point it was on aging hardware of the 3DS, which was now going on its seventh year of being a console. And while the sales were better, they still didn't exactly light the world on fire. The critical reception though, as per usual, was quite good. This new version would feature a lot of improvements. Largely, the most controversial of these seemed to be the change in art direction. Now, before I get into this, I've seen a lot of arguments online for both styles, and it feels like, empirically speaking, people like the older style more. The original artwork by Hiroshi Konishi is quite excellent. His art uses a lot of chiaroscuro, or use of light and dark to create depth. While this isn't entirely original, of course, this sets his work apart from many of his contemporaries. The newer art by Misaki Hiruka of Castlevania Order of Ecclesia fame is a little more lavish by comparison. The colors are much less muted, the clothing details have all been emphasized, and the characters are much softer overall. The characters also now have multiple pieces of art to show their mood and mural-style cutscenes to accompany the gameplay. It's a far less harsh style than Hiroshi Konishi's. Rainy's features, for example, have softened overall. Marco looks a little less like a chipmunk man. I would be tempted to say the new style is more anime, but that feels a little pejorative when I don't mean it to be. Mr. Haruka's designs, however, are indebted to and very respectful of the initial character design outside of Erika. The original game had her with a bold, unprincess-like hairstyle. The new design has given her long, much more traditional princess-looking hair. I can see how the change in style, though, might rub some people the wrong way. But as often is the case with artwork, I don't think you can point to one being definitively better than the other. Both of these artists are immensely talented and have very accomplished resumes under their belts. Each brings a unique approach to their art, We're only all the better for being able to see two different visions for these designs. What isn't better, though, is that you can't pick the art you like in the 3DS edition without shelling out cash money. Atlas, very indefensibly, chose to sell you a feature that honestly has no business being paid. The old artwork lacks facial expressions and even is missing some characters that got portraits in the new game. To make matters worse, you can't even get the original artwork if you were to buy a cartridge of this game today. The eShop closure means this feature is gone entirely. A very indefensible cash grab by Atlas for that one, and a bit of a sore spot on an otherwise nice update to the game. But by far the biggest addition to the game was the inclusion of a perfect ending, with an entirely new timeline to explore and new bosses to battle. Also included is a mode where if you were to hate all of the new content added, you could legitimately ignore it and just enjoy the new updated gameplay, character art, and voice acting. Short of me wanting this game available on a system that isn't dead so that more people could enjoy it, and the aforementioned paid art annoyance, there isn't a lot you could ask for in a new edition of the game, and a lot of that is thanks to the unique and solid storytelling that this game employs. The narrative of Radiant Historia twists and wraps around itself in so many ways it becomes a bit of a knot to talk about, but I'll say this much, it's very good. I will also say buckle up because with this game's multiple timelines snaking into one another, this is going to be a bit of a ride. It starts in the way most good stories do, with a thought out conflict and very clear stakes. While Peaceful Village with a main character is an equally valid way to start your adventure, this change acts as a bit of a called shot for Radiant Historia. The story here touches on some more mature themes, and while I wouldn't say it turns RPG conventions completely on their head, it is looking to tell a much darker, morally gray story. Until it doesn't, we'll get there. We open, like all good narratives do, on a pair of twin children standing in a desert, talking about vague stuff that we, the audience, lack a lot of context for if this is our first playthrough. I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit though, this is Lipti and Tio. We'll meet them a little more in depth later, but the short of it is, they're supernatural beings who live outside the flow of time. They're standing not just in a desert, but in a lifeless land that has been drained of all of its mana. They've failed in their mission. Knowing this, they agree to reset time back to a crucial point and begin again. And it just so happens that that point in time takes us back to where the war was at its absolute peak when all of this went down. Bloodshed has broken out on the continent of Vancouver. The two largest powers are locked into a war without a foreseeable end. 
something called the desertification is taking hold of the land, and it's a real problem. Starting from ancient ruins in the west, this phenomenon is literally draining the land of life, turning it into deserts. Once green, lush forests are becoming barren stretches that support no life. The blight is heading west as well, making land uninhabitable. As a result, fertile land is becoming harder and harder to find, and the majority of the powers have begun to fight for dominion over their slowly vanishing resources. Alistel, a theocracy, claims the religious figurehead, the prophet Noah, needs him to conquer rival nation Granord in order to bring salvation to the non-believers. Unlike Granord, where it is banned, the people of Alistel are fully committed to using mana and thaumatech energy to better their lives. Granorg, alternatively, is a monarchy led by Queen Protea. They claim domain over Alistel, as the people of Alistel are nothing more than separatists who left the kingdom with Noah several decades ago, following a dispute with the monarchy over, you guessed it, the use of Thaumatech. Thaumatech being steampunky, magic-y stuff, it'll make sense as we go. Protea is helped in this effort by her court knight Dias and Count Selvon, both of whom are cunning tacticians and close confidants. They command an impressive army compared to Alistel, but they lack the technological advancements of their enemy. This constant war has gone on for a very long time, with key tactical footholds like the Sand Fortress being conquered and reconquered constantly. This leaves both sides dwindling on supplies and stretching themselves thin. Unrest is beginning to bubble up in Granorg over this, but the Alistelian people seem much less concerned as their prophet Noah assures them that their cause is just. A key to the Alistelian success is a man named Heist. Under his watchful eye, a new special intelligence, or SI branch, has formed within the Alistel military. His protege is a young man named Stock, who has proven to be formidable and effective in any missions he carries out. He's also who you happen to control in this adventure, and he walks kinda silly. But we won't hold that against him, because Stock is cool. Like, I wanna hang out with Stock. He's calm in times of stress, He's dressed in the brightest, least sneaky, crimson red you'll ever see a special intelligence secret agent in, but my man looks good as hell in this coat, so the results do speak for themselves. He's reserved and confident in his strength without bragging and does a good job of possessing an emotional intelligence that makes him a good leader. In short, he's a well-adjusted adult man who can talk about his feelings. That alone should set him pretty far apart from many JRPG protagonists. While being quiet originally made me think he was teeing up to be an edgy, angry boy, honestly, he just has an air of professionalism about him. We step into Stock's shoes as he's receiving a new mission from Heist. He's going to rendezvous with a deep undercover agent who will be delivering intel to the Alistelian forces. If this information makes it back to Alistel, it could mean the end of the war. While receiving this debriefing, Heist provides Stock with two things before he heads out. One is a strange book. The White Chronicle, a book made up of entirely blank pages. This, according to Heiss, is a good luck charm to help on his next mission. Stock is also given command over two new SI agents, Rainy and Marco. These two are your first party members and two former mercenaries. They joined Special Intelligence after their war band was wiped out in a tragic incident inside of a mine. As luck would have it, they were rescued by Heiss. Both are now determined to repay him after owing him their lives. Between the two, Marco is kind and gentle. He seems like a halfling adjacent character. I say this because best I can tell his smaller stature is never really addressed. He's just sorta of the little ball of a guy. He's itty bitty. He's supposed to be 17, the same age as Rainy. What he lacks in height, he makes up for in courage and kindness though. Marco isn't afraid to help or assist and often sees the best in others even when it would be easier not to. This is reflected through gameplay by his moveset focusing strongly on healing and support magic for the team. His attacks are not super damaging, but he's never a bad character to keep around. He's a wonderful foil then to his compatriot Rainy. Rainy has a fiery and strong personality and is a touch smitten with stock as the story progresses. <laughs> You're just as aloof as he said you'd be. I like that. A man should be reserved, not some chatterbox who can't keep his mouth shut. Ladies, I don't see it. An emotionally stable, muscular, quiet guy who's upfront and honest about his feelings? <laughs> Yuck. She should be more into what I would call squishy men who do things like 
make YouTube videos in their free time, build Gundams, and definitely didn't cry at the end of the 1981 animated classic Unico. It was dusty in the air that day, and it just so happened that Unico taught everyone a valuable lesson about love and found family as said dust entered this guy's eyes. It's merely coincidence, nothing more. <laughs> Rainy uses spears for physical attacks, but her true most helpful skill is her powerful offensive magic. In the game, she's a punch first, ask questions later type, and her very all-in offensive skill set does a wonderful job of expressing her character through gameplay. While certain characters you recruit in the future might be unavailable in specific timelines, these two will be a constant in your party. Perhaps for this reason, I really grew to like the two as the story progressed. As they make their preparations to set off, Stock is greeted by a vision of Rainy and Marco's corpses laying in the rain. Is this the case of an overactive imagination on Stock's end? Or is this the stress of now having two people under his command? Perhaps this is all just a premonition. A deadly premonition. Well, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna find out in a second, but it, it is a premonition. As our newly formed team prepares to leave, we're given our first glimpse of life into Alistel from Stock's perspective, as we explore and collect supplies. The streets here are hard steel. It's a cold and unwelcoming place visually. The city is uniformly gloomy and a sheet metal gray. The architecture of the city is cold and utilitarian. Steam pipes unceremoniously leak into walkways made of patchwork steel. That's not to say this is a joyless place. The inhabitants, of course, are still human after all. Children play in the streets. People live their lives. But Alistel is at war, and the city as a whole certainly lacks a soft touch visually. The squad sets off from the city to the nearby Laville Hills. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, fellow fans of world maps, but we'll just be picking locations from points in this game. And it's here that they discover the mole they were tasked with meeting has been discovered and is in danger. The whole area is crawling with soldiers pursuing the spy. Thankfully, you find the spy before Granorg's forces do. As the trio desperately tries to escort the agent back, it quickly becomes apparent that the enemy has set an impossibly thorough trap for everyone. The goal was to sneak out, but Granorg seems mysteriously too prepared for this scenario. Escape routes are blocked with giant boxes. Archers are positioned in nearly every conceivable vantage point. The enemy has a nearly precognitive understanding of how Stock's team is going to act. They even manage to kill our spy before we get him back home, which puts us in the tough position of having to report our own failure. With our main objective failed, that means we have no choice outside of fighting our way out which would make this a good time to talk a little bit about the battle system. So this is the battlefield. Enemies will be on a three by three grid and you will be locked, tragically, without a board of your own to move around here on the right. On the bottom screen, you'll have the turn order of who goes next. To perhaps make up for your being immobile though, you're given the opportunity to move your enemies around. You'll have special abilities that'll do things like knock them left, right, up, or down. The goal then is to stack all of your foes onto a single tile. Now, when you attack the tile they're all occupying, you'll hit every single one of them at once, meaning you'll want to spend turns putting your opponents into a neat little pile and then bursting them down with potent attacks. The game makes sure this is the best option by giving you no real ways to hit large areas of enemies at once. A couple of moves extend to slightly larger areas like single columns or rows but by far the most effective way to crunch your enemy is to mush them all in a ball and then hit that ball. The catch then is that enemies cannot start the turn on the same tile, so they will unpack to the surrounding tiles when they come up in the turn order. Just in the same way that you can manipulate their position, you can also manipulate turn order, however. You're allowed to swap places with your enemies in the timeline, putting their turn ahead of yours in exchange for longer, unbroken chains of turns. This has two advantages. One, they stay in their stack for longer. And two, you'll amass combo points. Combo points are accrued for each of the turns you attack without letting the enemy have a move. The combo will increase then, which makes your damage multiplier go up as well. Things like healing spells will not increase this, so you need to choose the balance between offense and defense during your turn strings. Later, you'll unlock abilities to mess with the turn order in other ways, but the core idea is still there. Try and line up your party to get a lot of consecutive moves. Use those turns to push the enemy into one place 
and then unleash huge damage on them. This means that every battle plays a lot more like a puzzle than your run-of-the-mill turn-based RPG. To pull off a super impactful play in this game feels pretty good. It rewards your planning. In a lot of ways, it acts as kind of a mini microcosm of the game's themes. As we'll see shortly, Radiant Historia is about manipulating time, so it's quite fitting to have a battle system that is about changing and manipulating turn order and using those powers to change outcomes. The puzzle-like feeling really shines with some of the boss encounters. The game isn't afraid to throw new mechanics in for some of these fights to add a little bit more spice to the mix. Maybe immovable enemies, special tiles, or enemy formations will be something you run into. Some mechanics will only show up once or twice, keeping a definite air of spontaneity to the battles. It's clear the design team understood how to take their base system and keep finding ways to have it surprise you throughout the runtime. Perhaps the only critique, though, that I would level at the battle system is that by the nature of the strategy involved, there isn't a lot in the way of short encounters. Most enemies will require you use some turn order manipulation, and so you end up putting in a little more time than I'd like on some less exciting filler fights. Even common enemies will hit you pretty hard to make up for the fact that you can stack them. So if it's five normal goblins near your level, they can still pose a threat if you don't use the systems effectively, because they'll simply get too many turns if you just attack them point blank. You'll need to efficiently approach every enemy, which extends battle time. Another thing that you might have caught if you've been looking at the footage up to this point is that there's a lot of pallet swapping enemies in this game. And while I'm sure some of this is symptomatic of how little memory a DS cartridge has, it still could get on your nerves. I know I personally got a little tired of seeing bees and goblins. But overall, this is a minor complaint on top of what I would still call a refreshing approach to genre conventions. Still, uh, if you truly don't want to deal with fights at all, uh, there is a new difficulty option in Perfect Chronology that you just makes the battles look like this. This effectively makes the game a little closer to a visual novel, but it's cool to know there's something here for everyone. But battle system out of the way, how does the remaining escape work for Stock and crew? Well, not great to be honest. Eventually, Stock and his crew are forced along, like rats in a maze, into a giant bridge that runs through the center of Laville Hills, also a choke point. With nowhere left to go, they must make a final stand. It's here that they face the giant, imposing knight Palomides, the Executioner. Here, as the rain soaks the mud, Stock and crew desperately fight the famously strong and armored knight. Something seems amiss. They shouldn't be in this dangerous of a scenario with such a simple mission, but there's little time to think on that. Rainy and Marco are killed trying to create an opportunity for Stock to escape, and Stock himself is badly wounded. Knowing he must alert HQ of their failure, and facing certain death at the hands of one of Granorg's mightiest soldiers, Stock makes the hapless choice to jump off the bridge into the river as a means of desperate escape. With the perpetual rain pouring down, Stock stands no chance of fighting against the rushing current of the river as he's swept downstream. Behind, he leaves the dead bodies of Rainy and Marco in the mud, fulfilling his disturbing premonition from earlier. As Stock washes up on the banks of the river, we see the two twins from the beginning of the game appear and whisk him off into a ball of green light. When he comes to, Stock finds himself in what he thinks might be heaven, but is in fact Historia. This place exists outside of time. It's here that we're introduced to the realm's two keepers, Lipti and Teo. I mentioned them briefly in the beginning, but here they introduce themselves to Stock and explain that he is there because he is the rightful holder of the White Chronicle. Turns out that the blank book Heist gave us wasn't just a blank book. By merit of being this book's owner, he'll have control over time itself. With the powers he receives from this book, he'll be capable of going back to key points in time and changing his decisions. He'll be free to explore all the possibilities that his actions could lead to. They also inform Stock of the presence of a second book, the Black Chronicle, with powers similar to his own. It turns out that the owner of this book is already out using these powers, and in fact, were using the book against him during his last mission, hence it feeling like an impossible undertaking. Stock, who was pretty sure he was a dead man moments ago, is understandably a little dubious of all he's hearing, but he's also torn up over Marco and Rainey having both given their lives while under his command. If there's a chance this does work and he can save them, he'd be willing to try it, but changing time is a little bit of a fantasy. The twins invite him to test the powers of this book for himself in order to check the validity of their claims. Turns out, on his escape, there was a moment when Stock encountered a blockade to his south and a trap to the north. He chose the north, 
but the twins tell him to revisit the scenario again, this time to try the South Passage again because perhaps he missed a key detail or something important. Now, being returned to the crucial moment when he decided to go north on their escape, Stock is able to confidently tell his party to go south. Here, Tio and Lifty reveal that the crates blocking his way prior were actually the work of the Black Chronicle. They were an outlier in time, they shouldn't have been there. He's granted the power to push them with his own supernatural strength now, and as a result, change history back. He and the crew avoid the platoon that they ran into on the bridge last time, escaping safely to the edge of the Lasville Hills, which means they can return alive as a complete unit and deliver the spy and the intel back to headquarters unharmed. A huge victory for Alistel. Looks like things are going great for Alistelian forces. All they had to do was just manipulate time itself. Easy. The only catch, however, is time still moves linearly for stock. Just because he's moved about in time doesn't set him back to the state he was in before. This isn't him being sent into his body at key points in time, so much as him being placed in the stead of where he was, as though he used his own understudy in a play. As a result, he collapses in a pile, all the wounds he sustained when he fought Palamedes finally overcoming the adrenaline of being able to save his comrades. He's hoisted unconscious back to his hometown. Once Stock comes to, he's greeted by his childhood friend and newly promoted captain of the army, Rosh. Rosh is a huge, hulking man who must be eating whatever Marco isn't because he stands at least a head taller than almost all of the cast and about twice as wide. He has little dust clouds when he walks. He's, he's that kind of big. He wields an enormous lance and is capable of great feats of strength thanks to his Thaumatech mechanical arm. Despite having lost his real arm in a prior battle, this replacement works just as well, if not better. Given his hulking size, you'd imagine Rosh would cleanly fit into the big strong dummy archetype, but that couldn't be further from the truth. He is charismatic and a natural born leader. He cares about his troops and would gladly put his own life on the line if it meant securing their safety. Everyone must stick together at all times inside the mine. Whatever happens, under no circumstances should you go off alone. Of course he has a major flaw and that he does not question anything the army asks him to do at first. It's something I appreciate about Radiant Historia though, the characters aren't static, they will change as the story goes on. The game's not afraid to play around with expectations and keeps you on your toes for how the characters will develop. Rosh is understandably worried that SI missions are creating a lot of danger for stock. They've clearly landed him in the ER, so, you know, he's kind of got a point. So, he proposes pulling strings with his commanding officer, Lieutenant General Raoul. This would allow Stock to join the newly formed brigade that Rosh is in charge of, making it possible that the two could work together once again, and leaving Rosh able to look out for Stock's safety, and vice versa. And while no doubt working side by side with his friend is appealing, there is a little bit of a catch as Stock is given another vision of the future, him standing over Rosh's dead body, his sword unsheathed. It appears as though, for some reason, he's going to kill Rosh, which seems wrong because he's on team besties with him and everything. All hope isn't lost though, he did manage to change his prior vision with Rainy and Marco. Perhaps whatever option he chooses here will end up affecting this future he's seen. This decision is left in Stock's hands to make ultimately and he's left to choose between continuing to be an SI agent or changing to the army. Both ways to help his nation's cause, but vastly different methodologies. Rosh knows he can't force Stock's hand, but begs him to consider the proposition. It's a decision that will literally split the timeline of Radiant Historia into two parts. Standard history, where you stick with SI, and alternative history, where you side with Rosh. This is not a case of you making one perfect timeline based on your decisions, but rather two parallel timelines that will be running in tandem. So that means this is a story of a man in two places simultaneously, but also somehow neither place. Standard history will see Stock sticking with SI and given an assassination mission to kill a monarch. The alternative history will be soldiers with a much more boots on the ground sort of approach to solving the war. This gives the game the ability to show you the same place over and over with different contexts. For example, this is the Sand Fortress. Do you like it? Because you're going to see quite a lot of it. It's a centrally located base of operations, and as a result, a key location in the war. Constant fighting over this site means that both factions in the war are in control of this base at different times. 
depending on who's in charge, will wildly change the context of your visit. This is a smart way to use the DS's limited memory as well. By repeating locations and changing your frame of reference, you can have the story unfold while not burdening the wimpy 4 gigabytes that the original DS version had to work with. And if this sounds a little complicated to keep track of, well, look at this fan diagram of how the story plays out. This flowchart is just for chapter 1, and there are 6 chapters of this. Organically, while playing through, this all makes a lot more sense. Stock's end goal becomes very singular across both timelines by the end too. He's going to eventually want to just stop the desertification. Thankfully, the UI makes things very easy to understand at a glance. Each node also mercifully has a very helpful little summary of what's going on, so even if you've had a break or are jumping back to a point in time that you haven't been to in a while, you rarely feel super lost. So, that's the basic premise and setup out of the way. Past this point, I can't quite guarantee your, I guess, spoiler safety, but I think it's important to explain some of the key themes that run through the game and, more importantly, compare the ending of this version to the original, because while thematically both endings share some DNA, they're in effect very different stories now. So while any spoiler adverse folks scuttle out to the timestamp below, enjoy this picture of a frog wearing a little hat shaped like a triangle. Hmm, yeah this looks good, and probably took up enough time that everyone who wanted to leave did. If you follow the alternative history timeline first, we'll be recruited into Rosh's brigade. As the troops assemble for their first mission, we're treated to a cutscene of the Alistelian leader, General Hugo, delivering the Prophet's words to his people. Incidentally, the Prophet has been sick lately and unable to appear in public. He has entrusted brave Hugo to be his mouthpiece. Conveniently, Hugo's speech happens to be entirely about how much the Prophet would like you to enlist in the army. Lieutenant General Raoul notices this convenient topic as well. He hints to our team that Hugo's ambition perhaps blinds him to doing what might be best for the people. Raoul is on the short list of characters in this game who have power, but still treat his subordinates well. A genuine guy. He cautions Rosh about getting on Hugo's radar because the man seems less interested in war and more with positioning himself into power once the war concludes. Rainy and Marco will be joining you in this timeline as well. It turns out you are a package deal, and more reason to earn Heiss's resentment for leaving SI. They took his three best agents. Now, a member of Rosh's brigade, Stock, Rainy, and Marco are by far the most experienced members by virtue of having seen any combat at all. While the troops are mostly green, some show great promise, including Kiel, who knows the art of sword dancing. And it's here I might mention that we'll be needing to gear up our characters while we're in town. This highlights one of the strange issues this game has in that its economy seems very frugal. When the game's played as it was intended to be on the DS, you'll find yourself often only able to equip one or two characters when you go to a shop, so there are a lot of times when you feel the need to grind out money in order to equip your team. I will say from personal experience, playing on the regular difficulty, I still was able to clear everything and only buy select characters upgrades. The Perfect Chronology Edition does some things to remedy this, but we'll get into that much later. The first job you get under Rosh's command is to fight back a planned sneak attack at the Alma Mine. Granorg's forces are planning on detonating a literal path through the mine, creating a new route for invasion. It will be Rosh's job to investigate this and stop them. Unfortunately for you, however, you're going to need to understand explosives to be an absolute asset for this mission, something you're going to learn in the standard timeline. You do this by helping a waylaid merchant, it's not very important, but it is a good example of how the game is going to make you go back and forth all the time in order to have the skills to progress. With this explosives knowledge though, the mission is a pretty simple piece of cake. You catch the Grand Org forces on their invasion, blow them up literally, and then kill the stragglers, you know, friendly like. This means Rosh's brigade returns as heroes. Immediately, the young soldiers are hailed as the young lions of Alistel by the people. However, Rosh and the Brigade are given very little time to bask in their victory. Behind the scenes, General Hugo is incredibly displeased with how much of the people's adoration Rosh seems to be racking up after only one mission. Wanting to keep himself in the spotlight, and by proxy the undisputed voice of the people, he decides to station Rosh out of the city, and hopefully out of the people's thoughts. He will be joining another highly decorated and celebrated war hero, Field Marshal Viola. 
in fact so celebrated that she's earned the nickname The Valkyrie. Unfortunately for her, she was also too popular and has been placed in the Sand Fortress, a giant stronghold at the front lines that I mentioned earlier and positioned defensively in a choke point in the mountains. It is the easiest place to march an army between the two nations and as a result is hotly contested. This place has been conquered and reconquered multiple times throughout the war. It is a pivotal piece of geography, a place where it wouldn't be unreasonable for a decorated hero to lose their lives in battle. Fortunate then that Rasha's only orders are to arrive at the Sand Fortress and assist Viola as she needs, which means we actually get a little bit of quiet time before the next big piece of action while we wait for orders from HQ. Stock uses this opportunity to be taught sword dancing by Keo, which is great news because it is going to be something we need in the standard timeline later. However, unbeknownst to Rosh and everyone at the Sand Fortress, General Hugo's lead Thaumatech engineer, Fennel, who's just like a head hooked up to a machine? I don't, I don't know. I mean, no one in the game's world remarks on how crazy this looks. I, I, I even have the art book here and I can't read it because it's in Japanese, but like, I, I don't think there's a level of existential dread when I think about him. Well, hello there, future Cody here. Uh, you know, I ran that text through an auto translator on my phone and it looks like the only thing I could really glean from this was that he was one of the first characters designed and Slug seemed to be the inspiration point. So existential dread and confusion still withstanding. It appears as though Finnell is cooking up the next set of operations for the Rosh Brigade. He needs data on his Thaumatech machinery, and the only way to get real data is through combat. So with the help of Heiss's scheming, he twists General Hugo's arm into pushing everyone at the Sand Fortress into full-fledged combat. As for his motivation, Heiss seems quick to punish anyone who dares take stock away from his team. It looks like on the side, Heiss and Hugo have been doing lots of scheming. We'll find out more about that later. What's important is Finnell is going to get his combat data. He doesn't seem to care who wins or loses, so long as he gets that sweet, precious data. I guess he works in marketing. Hey, anybody? No? Is that just me? Okay. The plan has Rosh's brigade act as an advance unit to find intel on enemy locations and numbers. Once they have this, they'll have stock rendezvous with the main force and deliver this intel to Viola, who will then attack with the new Thaumatech weaponry at her side. Once Viola has the enemy's attention, Rosh's unit will then advance in earnest, creating a pincer attack for the enemy. However, once the plan is put into motion, it is immediately clear that something has gone very wrong. As Stock arrives to get the data, what he finds instead are dead soldiers from Rosh's brigade. It seems the enemy knew of their plan and routed almost all of the battalion decisively. Stock manages to save Rosh thanks to an act of self-sacrifice from Keel. Despite his ability to travel through time, Stock is unable to save both Keel and Rosh in this scenario. Sergeant Stock, please make sure that our captain gets back to Alistel. Reform the brigade and claim victory over Granorg! Keel, stop! I want you to take Rosh back! Sergeant Stock, thank you for everything. They're here! I couldn't stop him. I knew it would be too dangerous, but I let him go. If only there was a node here, I could redo this moment. What good is the White Chronicle without a node? At the very least, I'll keep my promise to Kiel by saving Rosh. And someday, I'll come back here again. Even if I can't now, one day, I will find a way! Huh. Damn. Is this it? Keel's sacrifice is not in vain. Stock is able to get Rosh to help. However, the damage to Rosh's Thaumatech arm and body as a whole are too severe for the sick bay at the Sand Fortress so Rosh is going to need to be taken to Alistel for more critical treatment. Not exactly the safest place when you worry you might have been betrayed by your own nation. Stock is immediately and rightfully suspicious that Hugo and Heiss might have something to do with this. 
Stock meets with Lieutenant General Raoul, and they both conclude that the only way Roche could be so thoroughly ambushed is if someone inside had sold out the information on the plan. It doesn't take a lot of pondering to lay the blame at the feet of General Hugo. However, without any evidence to prove this, they're left with only conjecture. To get some hard evidence, Stock plans to use his spy skills to infiltrate General Hugo's office and find something tying him to the act of betrayal. Lucky for us, Hugo hella dumb, and in fact does leave incriminating evidence just sitting around. It seems we're not sneaky enough to avoid the watchful eye of the head of the SI, however. It's here we encounter Heist, who it turns out is not only super strong for an old man, but can teleport. Stock, remarkably, can copy the teleporting technique after seeing Heist use it only this once. He manages to escape thanks to the element of surprise this provides. It also seems to impress Heist enough that he doesn't bother to follow. Now what do you suppose Stock's next move will be? I can't wait to see what he does with that power now that he's awakened. Rather, this seems to make Heist actually kinda happy. He seems excited that Stock has learned this power so quickly. A proud, I guess, but also he was gonna hurt him? I don't know, it's a lot. Barely escaping at all, Stock realizes that Heist is going to alert the whole headquarters to the fact that he's nabbed incriminating evidence on General Hugo. Knowing that his friend's life is in danger if they stay, he enlists the help of a friend he has in the city. Together, they manage to get all the way out to the Lasville Hills before the city guard catches up to them. Needing to buy time for his friend to be hoisted to safety, Stock makes a final daring stand, doing ferocious combat with his own countrymen. Stock cuts down like a dozen or so soldiers while buying time for Rosh's escape. It turns out you're a bit of a killing machine. Unfortunately, despite having beaten the whole unit pursuing them, Stock's wounds are too great, and he collapses in the mud. Everything fades out, but before he loses consciousness, he sees two figures approaching him. But let's hold that thought here. I'm going to need to jump to the standard timeline now to give context for what happens next. In the reality of the standard timeline, Stock is not face down in the mud, but making his way to Granorg to assassinate Princess Erica, Queen Protea's stepdaughter, with the hopes of using the chaos this would create to destabilize the enemy nation. This is a mission from Heist, who offers up what I would like to call sinister sounding parting words. I suspect that in the course of your mission, you'll learn the truth about this continent. Excuse me? He's gathering info on that one of our objectives. No, but it would hardly be a waste of your time to find out. Once you know, you'll feel that it was better for you to have discovered it. So, that's something to look forward to. That will be all. Prepare yourselves first, then head to the bridge at Lasville Hills. Understood. Incredibly conveniently, once we arrive at the border, we find a group of satyros who are being attacked by wild animals. After we save them from the beasts, they share that they were a traveling theater troupe, and in order to thank us for saving their lives, they propose we act as members of their company to slip past the guards at the checkpoint and enter Granor. Since killing the guards and forcing our way into the border would raise the alarm and no doubt leave stock and company on everyone's radar, this is an easy yes. The three members of the troupe include Lise, a dancer and all-around bubbly type, Vanos, their leader and mentor, and tiny little Ott. Ott is nine years old, so it goes without saying she joins your party as a combatant. Nothing says tiny child like real life and death combat with the enemy, and she will kill without even batting an eye and steal. They gave the child the ability to steal. I'm not gonna sweat it too much though because she's super powerful, so like, you know, Steal to your heart's content. They're not gonna suspect the child. They're members of the Satyros tribe, which is like goat people, which, you know, satyr. They didn't exactly break the bank on this one creatively. Culturally, the Satyros are a lot different than humans. They're a deeply spiritual people in the world of Radiant Historia. They see the world much more holistically and have a great respect for things like the flow of mana and nature. Ott has another thing that helps her stand out though. She has a special gift that very few Satyros have. She is a shaman. It is her job and unique power to be able to see and guide the souls of the dead to the afterlife so that they might experience peace. Given how rare this ability is, it bestows upon her the role of being a spiritual leader to her people. So she's a child soldier, she knows how to steal, and a guide to the souls of the departed. <laughs> That's super well-rounded. That's going to look great on a resume when she grows up. 
Despite us claiming we're in a theater troupe, the guards at the border are a little less than thrilled to see us. In fact, they want us to prove our claim that we are a theater folk. Thankfully, Stock learned sword dancing, and if he ever wants to get out of the killing business, it seems he has prospects as a sword dancer, gauging by this guard's reaction. This scene would of course be impossible without having spent time in the alternate history. The game often puts these roadblocks in the way so that the narrative can make a little more sense to you, the player. While I don't mention every instance in this video, the game does a very good job at making you feel the impact of learning skills or gaining new contact. Returning to a prior point with the answer makes you feel a little bit like, you know, a super cool time traveler. Granted, the game doesn't allow you to move to any moment in time, but only major points in the story. These key points act as nodes you can select from the timeline and travel to. Thankfully, any cutscene you've seen once, you can handily skip with the press of the start button. This also allows the game to do recaps on story if you take a break. It's very easy to rewatch an old cutscene to catch yourself up, or I don't know, if you need like footage for a video and you forgot to hit record, so it's just as simple as that, wow! Radiant Historia will plant the same seeds in the way you interact with the world while traveling. In the same way it withholds story bits, Radiant Historia dangles delicious treasure carrots in front of you. Oh, why can I not reach this chest over here behind these vines? Well, it's on you to make a mental note or physical note or something. Some hours later, you're finally going to unlock the ability to cut down these vines thanks to the superior footwork you earn from knowing sword dancing. There are of course other RPGs that use very similar design sensibilities. Old school Dragon Quest games with locked doors or Chrono Trigger sealed chests jump to mind. This is a great way to reward the player for remembering a small detail or taking the time to re-explore old areas. It's the same dopamine receptor that triggers when you unlock a double jump in a Metroid game. Reaching new heights or locations in a literal way is a fantastic method to let you know that you're mastering the tools available to you. Not only is it a clever, tried and true way of gaining content, it also allows for a pleasant symmetry between the story and the mechanics. Hmm, yes, balance in all things. Once our party crosses the border, it's a short hike to Granort. And the first thing you'll notice walking into the city is how very different it is from the city of Alistel. Alistel's cold, mechanical design is contrasted here with wide promenades, elegant plazas, and classical looking stonework. Where Alistel trades in greys and steel, Granorg has time-worn stone and green trees. Upon closer examination, it seems the city is in a level of disquiet. The war has taken a much greater toll here than in Alistel. The populace doesn't have a divine prophet to keep them from questioning their authority's choices. People are beginning to disagree with the queen, Protea, and her expenditure on war as it's cutting into the needs of the people. It appears a rebellion is bubbling up under the surface as a result, but Stock and team are professionals and get to work finding a way to infiltrate the castle without getting involved with any outside noise. After following a few leads, we discover a secret passage into the castle via the underground sewers. <laughs> Bet you've never seen a sewer level in an RPG before. This might be the first time any video game has thought of putting a secret passageway in a sewer. Ever? It's groundbreaking. One short sewer dungeon later, you'll slip into the castle but quickly discover that the princess isn't there at all. In fact, this was a trap. A weaker man would use a princesses in another castle joke here, but <laughs> I'm not clever enough to think of a way to fit it in organically. Luckily, a member of the rebellion manages to save your team at the last second. He shows us a secret passage out to their secret rebel base, which is the bar. In return for the rescue, they ask Stock and crew to lend an ear to their leader. As luck would have it, that leader is Princess Erica. It appears as though many of her troubles began after her father passed away under mysterious circumstances. It turns out her stepmother, Protea, has been taxing the land to fund a never-ending war, but more importantly, neglecting a sacred ritual that the royal family of Granorg must complete. This ritual, she claims, is the key to stopping desertification from spreading any further, and it needs Granorg's royal bloodline, a very particular ritual and Protea married into the family, so she lacks the pedigree required. For obvious reasons, her dad can't do it. Despite Erica's pleading with her mother to set things right and allow her to perform the ritual, her mother seems to be wholly invested in keeping her power all to herself. 
For the most part, though, Protea isn't really in charge. Her two advisors, Court Knight Dias and Count Selvan, happen to both be pulling the strings very effectively in Granort. The Queen has proven very easy to manipulate with flattery and feigned deference. Erika is already aware of Stock's skill thanks to how handily he managed to sneak into the palace. So she requests his aid with the rebellion. Her hope is to avoid all the conflict by stopping the desertification and having no more reason to fight. This will only be possible, of course, if she deposes Protea as ruler and reinstates herself. Stock's question here is pretty obvious. Why trust him? He's definitely a spy for an enemy nation. And for this, Erika doesn't really have the best reason I've ever heard. It turns out her brother passed away some years ago, and Stock's resemblance to him is very uncanny. So, that's all she needs. You look trustworthy, you got a good face on you, kid. No matter what, though, this is not a choice to be taken lightly, and Stock needs time with Marco and Rainy to choose their next course of action. Erica tells them to take all the time they need and to lay low in the nearby village of Cornet to the east of Granite. There are sympathizers to the rebellion there, and the mayor will provide their team with refuge. This will allow them to hide outside the watchful eye of the city guard while they deliberate what to do. Eventually, the team reaches a rocky decorum. Stock intends to defy Heiss's immediate orders in order to assist Erica. After all, should this succeed, it would spell the end of the war, and by proxy, a mission completed with less bloodshed, a win-win. And while Rainy and Marco are a little colder to the idea because they owe Heist their life for saving them in the mine, they eventually come around to the idea and head back to the capital as a team. Unfortunately, while they were away, Protea had a really crazy deranged plan. Set it all ablaze. Pardon? Burn the city to the ground and let their cinders be mixed in with the rest of the ash. But the other citizens would also be caught in the... I care not! Anyone who harbors Erika or the Resistance deserves to share their fate! It's time the citizens remembered who holds the authority and power in this country! Queen Protea! <sighs> As you wish. Taking a page from history's best leadership, she decides the best course of action to rid the city of rebels is to just burn burn it down. You can't have a rebellion if you've burned it to ashes. I bet you didn't think of that, you stupid rebels. Dias and Selvan are both aghast at the queen's plot and can't manage to shake her from this idea. But in typical fashion, they look to turn this insanity around for their own benefit. They decide to pin the fires on the rebellion and use this to consolidate the inevitable rage of the people toward their enemy. Worst comes to worse, perhaps this is an opportunity to squash the rebellion anyway. Arriving in the city to help the citizens and stop the soldiers from setting fire to their own city, we bump into Erica, who now becomes a member of our party. Combat-wise, it should be noted, she is a great ally. Narratively, she's a caring person who's not afraid to fight for her beliefs. Mechanically, in her gameplay, this is shown with her great combo of buffs, debuffs, and highly damaging magic. This makes Erika one of the better characters to keep in your party for any occasion. For my money, more impressive than the damage output though is this gun twirling. All that aside, Erika makes a good addition to the party because she provides the viewpoint of a Grand Org citizen, or well, royalty, but the Grand Org side of the battle, which is unique to her. Of course, she also has a very pivotal role to play in the story, as we'll soon find out. In the meantime, Grand Orc is burning, so your priorities are going to shift a bit. Stock and the rebels need to help Erica escape the city. Now, seeing the full capacity of her mother's madness, Erica decides to reach out to ally King Garland in the south and entreat his aid. King Garland rules over the city-state of Cygnus, and in order to get south, we're gonna have to go through, you guessed it, the Sand Fortress again. Perhaps it's the beige walls, but this is the only location in the game I was kind of tired of seeing by the end. Despite all of our running, we can only make it about as far as the Judgment Cliffs before nightfall. Thankfully, our ever-dependable murder child, Ott, knows a place her troop used to rest when traveling through these very same mountains. It happens to be an incredibly cozy grotto. Here, Stock and Erica talk for a while by the campfire. Do you sense a little chemistry here? Cause <laughs> I do. I'm sorry. 
I shouldn't carry on like that in front of others, but it's strange. Whenever you say my name, the storm in my heart calms. You are much like my brother. My name is Stock. I am unfortunately not your brother. Are we foreshadowing a love triangle right now? Is it gonna be happening? Oh my god! But you're not granted a lot of time to dwell on this maybe flirting because Rosh literally emerges from a bush. He's a big man, I don't know how we didn't see him, but we're not gonna sweat that. Rosh, of course, still works for the Alistelian army, and he's been sent to find out why Stock hasn't completed his mission and in fact absconded away with the princess he was supposed to kill. It appears news of Stock's descent has already reached Heiss through his network of spies, and clearly, he's displeased. Seemingly, he sent Stock's best friend as punishment. It seems the idealist in Rosh thought to convince Stock to go ahead and finish the task of murdering Erika. Rosh is loyal and hard-headed, two positive traits when he's on your team, but horrible ones when he's your opponent. He will not stand down, and your refusal to finish your mission is tantamount to betrayal. While Rosh loves you as a friend, he loves his country more, at least in this timeline, as we'll discover. And so, unceremoniously, you kill your best friend. Standing over his corpse, you realize your earlier vision of his dead body has now come true. Of course, everything said and done, Stock tells no one of what occurred, and lets Marco go ahead and take his shift watching the fire. Unfortunately, Marco does not get to tell anyone of the impending danger, because a strange cloud of gas descends on the encampment and knocks everybody out. Our party seems to have had a terrible stroke of luck in the standard timeline, but the good news is we left them face down in the alternative history as well, so it's going great. Well, it's going to get better. Let's hop back to the alternative history. In this timeline, Stock wakes up in the land of Celestia, the beautiful and ethereal forest home of the Satyros. The sanctity of this land is protected from outside influence by a magical barrier. You cannot enter this place without powerful magic or a citizen's permission. It seems that Ott, in this timeline, while having never met Stock, feels an unknown connection with him from the other timeline and is compelled to help him. She and her assistant Gafka are the two that you saw right as you were going unconscious. Gafka will be your final party member. He is a part of the Gutral race, who have a lot of gorilla vibes. Exiled from his hometown of Forgia, Gafka has seen much of the world and adopted a very monk-like wisdom. He's interested in honor, and despite his people's hate for humanity, has discovered that he himself doesn't believe them to be entirely evil. His worldly travels have changed him. I like the wise warrior guy who's super chill even though he's incredibly strong, and Gafka doesn't change my feelings on that in any way. He joins Stock in the alternative history after some very key events that we'll get into soon. He also charmingly seems to be very bad with human names ah, there you are, red one. and calls Stock the Red One, which is what my mom called Mario, so maybe Gafka's my mom, or maybe Stock is Mario. I'll get back when I know for sure. Story-wise, the more Gafka learns to balance his bestial rage with his for lack of a better word, human side, the more powerful he becomes. Finding balance in all things is the key to his success. Even better still, he unlocks many multi-hit moves, which is great because you might need some of those high combo numbers to fight some of the later bosses. Overall, he's a very powerful and good choice for the party. In fact, now that we've introduced them all, I don't think any of the party members in this game are really duds. I would imagine you could beat this game with whatever party you like. Worries with optimizing the party aside, once Stock gains his bearings and begins to explore Celestia, it appears as though his last stand was not in vain. The biggest issue is Rosh. While he's recovered mostly from the physical damage he suffered, his Thaumatek arm was not repaired before we fled Alistel. Unfortunately, now that we're traitors, the only place where we could go to effectively fix this arm would be Alistel proper, and for obvious reasons, I doubt they'll be seeing Rosh. The Rosh that remains is a little more than a shell of his former self. No longer the collected, confident leader we had before, but a man who's lost all faith in himself, and doesn't even have two working arms anymore. As a result, he's nearly catatonic and not engaging with anyone. Unable to help his friend for now, Stock entreats the Elder of Celestia for shelter for he and his friends. The Satyros, like every other non-human race in the game, does not really trust humans. Thankfully, this timeline's Ott trusts Stock implicitly, the game actually plays this card a couple of times. People just learn to trust Stock. 
And while yes, the real answer is because the story needs them to, it seems Stock's influence reaches through space-time. So if you've learned to trust him in one timeline, a part of you will know intrinsically that he is a trustworthy guy in the other timeline? I'd be lying if I said this didn't seem a little too convenient narratively, but I'm just gonna move on. Deciding to trust him, the elder Celestia bids Stock to join his spy, Vanos, who disguises himself as a traveling performer in order to collect information on faraway countries for his homeland. Oh, the performers thing's a ruse to gather intel. <laughs> Sly. While Celestians cut themselves off from the world, Vanos and his troop will bring news of the outside to keep their finger on the pulse just in case something dangerous looks to involve them, which given the whole constant war thing seems like a fair one to check in on. When Stock and Vanos arrive back in Alistel, it's clear the city has taken a drastic turn in the time it took Stock to recover. It appears as though the Prophet's latest declaration delivered by Hugo tells the people that the Satyros are to be brought into the fold and proverbially saved. This, of course, will be done with violent colonialism. Furthering the shakeups, Lieutenant General Raoul was ousted from his position, leaving all power in Hugo's hands. Luckily, thanks to some well-placed connections on his end, Raoul was able to reach Stock. It turns out that he didn't die, he avoided his assassination attempt. Raoul suggests that he meets the leader of Celestia to form a plan to stop the madness of General Hugo. It appears as though Celestia's isolationism is about to come to an abrupt end. Hugo intends to take the land as it will make for more usable territory should the desertification continue to spread. Raoul fortunately has an ally in the desert kingdom of Cygnus who's ready to fight back. But before that can happen, he'd like to enlist the aid of the Satyros of Celestia as well. For any of this to happen though, the soldiers will need a frontline commander. Someone who is talented and charismatic to lead them. Maybe someone with huge, I don't know, robot arms and sweeping red capes. They're gonna need Rosh. The catch is, he only has one arm currently and is working through some seriously warranted trauma. What do you expect me to do like this, Stock? you. Why didn't you protect your men? That's your duty as a superior officer. You're nothing but a... Forgive me. You did nothing wrong. I'm the one to blame. I was so Deciding to run the risk of maybe furthering his spiral of PTSD, Stock goes for a Hail Mary and spars with his one-armed, emotionally damaged friend, Rosh. It's sort of a emotional but punch-laden pep talk. I told Keel that whatever it took, I'd save your life. I did that because Keel and the others believed that you'd be the one to avenge their deaths. But looking at you right now, <sighs> you're not the man they believed in. Your men didn't give their lives for whoever you are to survive. If I save someone just pretending to be Rosh, I'll never be able to face them. Are you serious? You can give your apologies to Keel in the next world. This hurdle must be especially hard for Rosh to overcome. His arm, which was granted to him by the Alistel military, has left him feeling like his very life was their property. Spar might be the wrong word for what they're doing. Stock attacks Rosh. I guess the thought is if you make him fight for his life, he'll see the value in it. One time riding home at night, I got hit by a car on my bicycle. Unfortunately not the start to my isekai journey. It didn't exactly make me feel refreshed the next day or even ready to seize said day. I'm fine, by the way. Perhaps if the guy had pulled over and given me a pep talk instead of peeling off. But anyway, Stock manages to lift Rosh's spirits through the power of friendship and hitting. I mean, I suppose he knows Rosh in and out at this point as a friend, and sometimes you gotta let bros work it out in their own special way, I guess. I would have gone for kissing the boo-boos, but this is why I'm not stock. The real hurdle now will be getting Rosh's destroyed arm into working condition. If only we had, like, a copy of Rosh that didn't need his arm. Oh, right. We killed him and wept over his dead body not long ago in the standard timeline. So, using time travel, we'll re-kill our best friend, and this time rip essential parts from his mechanical arm once we slay him. We're killing him to save him. This is normal friend stuff, <laughs> I promise. And yeah, it's a little grim, but in a perfect world, you could just call this upcycling and charge him more for the parts. 
One back alley doctor visit later, Rosh is restored and feels renewed purpose. He must live on because his men believed in him. To give up would be wasting their valiant sacrifice. He will be the vehicle so that their dreams can live on. This change is so powerful, it will echo through space-time. If you return to your campfire encounter with Rosh, you discover both timelines have lined up now. He is helping Lieutenant General Raoul in both. Slowly, the purpose of everyone is convening on the intent of restoring peace and reinstating the ritual that will stop the desertification. However, it won't matter if Rosh lives or dies in this encounter, you're still going to get hosed with sleeping gas. So I guess it's time to hop back over to the standard timeline. After being gassed and put to sleep, Stock, Erica, and crew find themselves conveniently transported to Cygnus, their destination. Sort of like falling asleep on a car ride and then you're just home when you wake up. Except here we're going to be sold as gladiators. A tiny bit of a cold reception, not that Cygnus proper is cold. Cygnus is a desert town, scorched by the heat. The desertification has swallowed everything around almost completely. Life is harder here than Alistair or Granort. But what you can find is all types of unsavory sorts. For example, they'll sell people. Stock looked like a good warrior and uh, was scouted with sleeping gas to be a gladiator. However, their new king, Garland, is looking to keep a sense of honor among all these thieves he presides over. Cygnus was mostly small, independent nations until they were united under a singular rule of his majesty, Lord Garland. And he's a man so manly that it hurts to describe. This guy values strength, as it is what allowed him to find his path to power. Shut it, Edge! I'm Garland, and I run things here in Cygnus. <laughs> I'm glad someone has the guts to stand up to me every now and again. Shackles can't find the soul. Something like that. I like the fire in your eyes. He also values people with a burning, fiery passion, which Stock luckily has. Garland is intrigued and challenges him to a duel. Because he's manly, and that's how manly kings, I guess, figure things out. And sure enough, you'll be fighting a one-on-one -on -one duel with Garland himself. And this is probably the first battle where I found out how powerful poison is. If an enemy in this game can be poisoned, you'll want to go ahead and drop that status ailment ASAP. Trust me. After besting him in one-on-one -on -one combat, you are given your freedom back. Of course, in cool anime badass style, Stock remarks that Garland was probably holding back on him. But he'll never tell. Wink. Eventually, we'll need to win King Garland's trust in order to free Erica and the others. And in order to do that, we'll need to speak to him in a way that only he'll understand. It's not like that. She's my ally, Garland. If you'll permit me to treat with you on her behalf, man to man. Hmm. Huh. Well, if you put it that way, you have my full attention. That's right. Maximum manliness. This allows us to explain our situation to him and how we need his help supporting the rebellion. It so happens that General Dias of Granorg has also been making attempts to ally with Cygnus, but Garland suspects foul play, and rightfully so. Dias has a track record of being a really sneaky dude and a great lack of respect for Garland's ability to play at political theater. His talks and negotiation are nothing more than a ruse to bring his larger numbers of troops and demand fealty from Garland's nation. However, what Garland lacks in politicking, he certainly makes up for in being an amazing judge of character. Based on this, he decides to ally with Erica and instead do a counterattack with her on General Diaz. And so will throw his hat in with the young hopeful princess and join the rebellion. While Diaz marches his troops to the front door in a show of power, Garland will use this opportunity to spring an assault on Diaz and make an opening declaration of his newfound allegiance. Using a sandstorm that only the desert people would see coming, Garland uses the terrain to his advantage against Dias's superior numbers. It seems, in Dias's arrogance, he forgot the disadvantage that battling Cygnus on home turf would entail. Despite his blunder, Dias is still a grade-A strategist and, of course, has all of his strongest knights by his side. His heavy battalion is led by none other than the knight Palamedes, who you might remember as the man that killed all of us much earlier at the beginning of the game. Now is our chance for revenge. Stock is not the man that he once was. Having traveled through time, he's gained countless moments of experience and is now ready for this battle. It's a very cathartic moment to finally down this knight after so long. 
it feels like a good payoff narratively. Of course, some of this is also helped by the amazing boss fight music, which makes this a very good moment to take a detour briefly to talk about the sound in this game. Yoko Shimamura is a name I'm guessing you know if you follow video game music, but on the chance you don't, let me be the first to excitedly tell you, she's kind of amazing. Some of the most iconic songs in the last 30 years of gaming can be attributed to her. Guile's theme from Street Fighter? <laughs> yep, that's her. Dearly Beloved from Kingdom Hearts? Yeah, better put another point on the video game classics board. Also her. Super Mario RPG soundtrack, Live Alive, Xenoblade Chronicles, it's an expansive library of work. There is little question in my mind that she is up there with the grace. I imagine there's no shortage of people asking her to do their game soundtrack, so how do you get a legendary composer to work on a brand new RPG? Well, in the case of Radiant Historia, you cold call her. According to an interview with Shimamura on a now deleted Atlas page, thank you Internet Archive, they just emailed her out of the blue. Of course, she assumed this was a scam at first because I mean, well like, that's how most scams start? Eventually though, she thought better of leaving the call and answer and cautiously replied. Lo and behold, this job did end up being real. She asked for images of the scenery in order to get a feel for the tone and set quickly to work, pretty much free to explore the soundtrack as she saw fit. The team didn't want to hamper her style, they really wanted her to do her thing. I guess you don't go to a 5 star restaurant and not see what the chef would recommend after all. The call was very correct to let her find the heart of the story through music. I'm sure it's becoming somewhat clear by now, but this game isn't exactly set in a world brimming with joy. The first song she ended up composing was the Alistelian City theme, which is quite fittingly sad. Sending them over to Atlas, she realized they had no feedback for these. They were approved right away, and I mean, I get it. Listen to the nervous, lonely energy of the Mechanical Kingdom. A perfect backdrop for a nation teetering on the brink thanks to constant war. This is just one example in a soundtrack I would say hits more than it misses. It's not all lonely dirges, however. Tracks get goofy and carefree or exotic and fun. Some of the light-hearted songs, like the aptly named Fun Times, remind me of some of her work for Super Mario RPG. I'm guessing something had to take a hit for the gorgeous music though, and a lot of my issues lie at the feet of some of the sound design. Of particular note is the nightmare screech that goblins make. Thankfully, through the itty bitty DS speakers, it's not terrible. The sound engineering here likely didn't get a lot of time because of the limited memory of the DS and probably budgetary concerns. And while I don't have a ton to say about voice acting in general, the fact that I can't think of any examples of egregious line reads probably speaks volumes. The only caveat here is that some of the characters are voice acted and others are not. Non VA'd characters are just provided with grunts to open their dialogue. The problem here is that they will mix the two, so sometimes you'll think you're able to just sit and listen to the game when it'll hit you with a grunt and you're back to reading. There are times when the end of one war is only the beginning of another. It's shameful, but such is the history of mankind. Indeed. True enough but I can't express enough how good that soundtrack is, including the epic boss music which is playing as you're fighting the Knight Palamedes. You remember what we were doing, right? Because I probably do, maybe. While Diaz managed to escape as we killed Palamedes, all that remains now for the Rebellion is to march on the crap- The Crapital? <laughs> all that remains now for the Rebellion is to march onto the capital of Granorg and put Erica back on the throne. Cygnus's might, unfortunately, won't be enough to take down the well-entrenched and well-armed soldiers of Granorg, and so Erica will play her final trump card, recruiting the Gutral people of Forja to her aid. Up until this point, we only met one Gutral, and that is Gafka from the Alternative History. And speaking of the Alternative History, our allies there will also need to become friends with the Gutrals. It seems General Hugo in that timeline possesses a weapon capable of mass destruction. No one's quite sure how he came to possess a weapon of such destructive power, but he is able to wipe out whole battalions without lifting more than a finger. 
And Hugo's not just talking a big game. In the alternative history, he has chosen to turn the entire Cygnus army into sand. If this power sounds a little familiar, it's because we're trying to stop a process that's turning the whole world into sand. Erica recognizes this as the work of Flux, meaning he must have control over the royal ritual grounds in the alternative timeline in some way. This also means that while each timeline's dealing with its own thing, your goals get very singular from here on out. So, quick spark notes on the war, we want to restore Erica to the throne, use the ritual to stop the desertification, and depose Hugo who's clearly using the Prophet's words to consolidate his own power. Unfortunately, the only Gutral we know, Gafka, isn't particularly helpful when it comes to connecting our group with his people. It turns out he's been banished from his homeland. In olden times, the humans used intrigue and trickery to abuse their alliance with the Gutrals, treating them as less than equals. While much time has passed since then, the old wounds are yet to heal, and they've distanced themselves from humanity. Luckily, there is one Gutral, Burgas, who has been in contact with Erica. It seems her vision of the future is a little infectious, because he, much like Stock before him, finds himself compelled to believe her. She wants the ritual not only to save her lands, but to ensure that the Blight doesn't make it out to the Gutrals as well. They live in what is currently a very verdant land, but the desertification could change that, and worse, bring war to their doorstep as humans get more desperate for inhabitable land. Erica's cause is a lot more just than most of the people running the show currently, so Burgess takes a bet on her. We're informed that there is in fact one way to earn favor with the Gutrals that they cannot refuse. Completing their sacred ritual and earning the Beast Mark. Deep within their native home in the jungles to the east lies the Holf Ruins. Braving the trials within, you can find the Beast Mark in the deepest antechamber. Obtaining this is no small task, but will earn the respect of the Gutral people. If you were to approach their leadership with this mark in your possession, they would have no choice but to listen to you. Great news then that the test ends with you holding a physical object, so we'll be able to present it in both timelines and begin talks of an alliance in each. It's also at this point in the game that Ott hints that there might be more to the ritual that isn't being disclosed by Erica as readily. I take a little offense with this method of storytelling. Having a character know what's up but admit that information when talking to others, even though it would be helpful to disclose said information, is somewhat common in storytelling. However, I did finish the game, so I'm gonna not pull an ot and I'm gonna let you in on some of what's going on. This ceremony is called the Ritual of Flux that requires a sacrifice, a willing one, to work. Not such an easy go-to solution anymore. There are layers to this ritual too, involving borrowing and splitting human souls, and it's all very convoluted. But at the core of it, someone needs to die in order for this thing to work, and they both have to have royal blood. One is the sacrifice who must be willing to give their life for the spell. The other is the spellcaster who will absorb their sibling's energy. Essentially, the spellcaster now has a super-powered soul capable of the ritual of flux holding the steady creep of the desertification until the eventual time the ritual will be needed again. So if this ritual needs royal blood, why are we worried about Stock, who is but a mere special operations agent? A mere agent who looks exactly like Erica's older bro. Oh no, weren't they like flirting at the campfire? But don't worry, we're gonna get back to that a little later. Erica's father and uncle were originally intended to be the choice for the sacrifice this generation but her father died before the ritual could be completed and her uncle went missing. This placed the burden of the ceremony onto the children of the king by necessity. Erica knows her bloodline is in a very bad way with her brother missing, but is going to try and perform the ceremony individually, not following protocol and hoping it goes well on account of the missing brother. Unfortunately, much like when I try and convince myself that eight olives and a saltine cracker is dinner, this simply won't cut it, but we'll get to the ramifications of that in a little bit. Getting back to the dungeon trial, it takes place in some rather uninspiring ruins in various states of disarray. If you aren't in the mood for grey rooms with varying amounts of rubble, I have terrible news about what the rest of this game has planned for you as you approach the end game. This dungeon, like many of the others, is free of pretty much any puzzle, you just kinda run through and kill stuff. Largely, this game is more concerned with the wars in the overworld and the political intrigue than dungeon. Perhaps as a result of the limitations of the hardware, dungeons are often repeating their scenery. It's pretty much all castle interiors, basements, sewers, or ruins. 
The good news, though, is that none of the dungeons are long enough to outstay their welcome to a frustrating degree. In keeping with that, we reach the end of the Hulk Ruins and reveal a double boss fight is in store for us. One is a beast man being controlled by the wielder of the Black Chronicle, and two is an enormous spider. This is the only encounter I can think of outside of the end game where you do two bosses in a row, so that's fun. After a long battle with both of our adversaries, the beast mark is now in our possession. We have earned the respect of the beast people and it's time to work on making an alliance. The Gutrals honor their word and agree to help us take back the city of Granork. Of course, in the alternative history, we also need the Gutrals' help, so the plan is a little more loosey-goosey. We just sort of walk into their homeland and show them the beast mark and say that we definitely got this in a legitimate way. However, just showing up out of the blue with the mark doesn't exactly inspire the Beastkin's full confidence. They do agree to honor this, though, probably because of the horrible crisis facing the continent of Vancouver. I can't stress enough that Hugo has, unexplicably, gotten a hold of a weapon that turns people into literal sand, so everyone seems pretty sure they want to stop that. The Elder of Forja asks a final favor to prove our sincerity. And, I mean, I get it. If you walked into my house with my garage door opener and said that you earned it by right in combat, that you get to sleep in my garage now, I'd probably have some questions. In order to win my trust, I'd be a little hesitant. You'd probably have to go pick me up a, a soda or something from the store, some sort of trial. In this case, the favor isn't a delicious soda, but saving captured Gutrals from Alistel forces stationed in the desert town of Scala. Scala is a little trading hub filled with drifters and merchants. It's not exactly a booming town, but it has a very rough, freedom-valuing culture, much like its nearby neighbor Cygnus. Presumably, the Alistelian forces occupied this area as fortification to capture or kill any stragglers from the now-destroyed Cygnus army in the alternative history timeline, something the local populace isn't exactly stoked about. Of course, thanks to that, Rosh devises a plan rather quickly to destabilize the Alistelian presence in the town while also freeing the captured Gutrals. They're going to start a riot. The people of Scholar are already at their limit with the occupying forces, so it should only take a nudge to set the plan in motion. Stock, Rainy, and Marco will find three off-duty soldiers, kill them, and take their uniforms. Once they secure these uniforms, they'll need to get changed into them. Why am I bringing up the step of changing, which is normally easily glossed over? Ah, well, because oops, Rainy forgot she's a lady and changed in front of the boys. Womp womp, oh Rainy. Inexplicable one-off fan service jump scare aside, it's time to step out into that big, beautiful, rioting city. You know what plan to stoke their frustration is clever, tough one. In the confusion, Stock, Rainy, and Marco all slip in and free the captives. Being prior Alistelian soldiers, the role comes very naturally to them. The enemy is driven from the town and the hostage is freed. We've now earned the allegiance of the Gutrals in both timelines. In the standard timeline, we have enough forces to confront Queen Protea and claim the throne for Erica. The rebel army and the Gutrals join forces and take back Granorg under the rightful rule of Erica. Protea's character really runs her whole delusional stepmother bit to the very bitter end. Selvan must understand as well. The Granorg that they nourished has come tumbling down, and the only one still unable to see it is you, Protea. You're the only one who cannot admit defeat, clinging to... Be silent, you insidious wench! I will not accept such falsities! I am Potea the Exalted, ruler of Granorg! No! Ruler of the entire world over! All shall bend to my royal will! Dias and Selvan, realizing their puppet has run her course, flee to Alistel. It seems they've been working with Hugo this whole time. The ambush that wiped out Rosh's battalion was in fact the work of Hugo, Dias, and Selvan conspiring all along. With Protea out of the way, Erica now has full unrestricted access to all of the royal artifacts, including Ethereon. This is a stone imbued with magic that is a key to performing the ritual. It allows the user to resist the power of Flux. It turns out casting the spell contains a great deal of mana draining essence, and this artifact will keep the user safe through it. If one were to perform the rite without the Ethereon, they would turn into sand having all of their mana removed from their body. This, we'll discover, is the same technology that Hugo is using for his people into sand weapon, kind of unsurprisingly. In the alternative history, Hugo has captured the chamber in Granorg's royal ceremony room and repurposed it into a weapon, thanks to the help of his lead Thaumatech engineer. This, of course, with the help of his allies Dios and Selvan. Now, 
With Ethereon, stock and crew should be safe to sneak in and sabotage the alternative history Hugo's plans. This plot sure gets twisty and turny, huh? We're nearing the conclusion of the story, and it's around this point that you'll probably want to start digging through the rather impressive number of side quests that this game offers. Much like Chrono Trigger and other time travel RPGs, these quests can affect the world in varying ways. These little mini-adventures run the gamut. They can change the world in substantial ways, or be as small as helping someone fall in love. The best part is how much world building a lot of these little dalliances provide. There's a huge breadth of knowledge that all these side quests cover. I really wanted to take a moment to invite you, if you do play this game, to do a lot of these side quests. Not only are they going to unlock different endings for you to see and new endings for the game as a whole, but they really give a lot of great context for the world building happening here. There's a lot of love that went into some of these. Speaking of love, there's even one where Rainy confesses she has feelings for Stock? Ooh? And he feels the same way? Oh? We're now free to march on the capital of Alistel. At this point, they've lost the war in a pretty big way. The Gutrals have proven to be powerful enough allies to turn the war greatly in the Rebellion's favor, and without the cheaty turn people to sand weapon, Hugo is cornered at the capital. It's here he delivers his final desperate message from the prophet Noah, and this time Noah himself is feeling well enough to stand by and watch. Wow, he's right there, in that suspicious fully enclosing cloak. That's probably him, I mean, Hugo said it is, right? To no one playing the game's surprise, this is a mannequin that gets knocked over almost immediately. Of course, seeing your prophet is actually a mannequin is a quick shortcut to having people freak out on you. As a result, Hugo is unable to keep the crowd under control. With the people against him in his holy war a bit of a sham, he decides to do the cool thing and go lock himself up in the castle. Hugo turns to Heiss for help in this scenario. Heiss, however, does this whole villain laugh in your face and then just leave him to his own devices move. Well, I hate to leave on a low note, but I should be going. I suppose if I want something done right, I'll have to do it myself. It appears as though Heiss's plans are unaffected by any of the events here. Heiss be scheming, and now Hugo be hiding. It turns out beneath Castle Alistel is an entire Thaumatech laboratory. The little wimpy Hugo decides to go and hide in said lab. This is perhaps the most boring dungeon in the game. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, unlike my real life, where I had to spend a lot of time on it. This dungeon is essentially going in a straight line and occasionally doubling back to find a switch, which will then let you go further down that straight line. The enemies, at least, look cool. I love big steampunk Thaumatech machines, but it's clear the designers just needed a longer dungeon here. At the end of this annoying complex, we find Hugo, who has recently decided to commit a very classic bad guy move right before we arrive. He hits us with the old use experimental technology on myself move. This involves inserting himself into a chamber of pure flux. The device is still very much untested, and even his lead researcher Fennel is like, don't do this. If the guy who can do human experiments because he gets more data says it's a bad idea, it's probably a bad idea. But bad idea or not, Hugo emerges completely glowy, so there's something. He believes himself to have communed directly with his prophet, and now by proxy is a pure and divine being. In truth, Hugo and the Flux have reacted with one another and now he has control over time. It looks like he hasn't gotten stronger per se, but now he can instantly rewind time. So even if you stab him, it won't matter as the wound will rewind back instantly, meaning no damage. In order to defeat him, we're going to need to get hold of an ancient relic sword. Big shout out to time travel because we can get Hugo to kind of sit there while we figure out how to hurt him. And this is going to be a side quest that's going to take us anywhere between 5 minutes to an hour depending on how much we did in advance of this encounter. I really wish that this had been mandatory leading up to this point because it's very anticlimactic to have him show up super powered and then you be like, oh I gotta wander around and figure this out. But wander around and figure it out we shall, and we'll discover that the artifact we're in need of is a magical sword named Historica. That's almost the name of the game. That's how you know it's an important sword. All that's left of the original weapon is a husk bereft of power. We find and bring the now depleted sword back to the Celestians, who are able to restore its original power back in the waters of their divine tree. Reforging Historica is a powerful moment, as it shows how Stock's approach to the world is a lot different from those like Hugo and Protea. Despite using violence to achieve his means, much like they do, he would rather build bridges and connect the people of the world whenever possible. 
he's classy, you know? Like, he has a regal air about him, like a long-lost prince or... Uh-oh, foreshadowing? Did he flirt with his sister? Historica in hand, it turns out Time Lord version of Hugo is back to being a big weenie when he can't rewind time, and we beat the heck out of him. As he continually tries to abuse Flux in order to fix his wounds, he bursts into flames thanks to the power of our new weapon. Lol, Lamau even. Come on, don't do war crimes, Hugo, and we won't have to burst you into flames, bud, okay? <laughs> so that means Hugo's down and Protea is down, so all that stands in the way of helping save the world is doing that ceremony, right? Right? First thing to get out of the way, Heiss is super powerful and has done some real crazy stuff. Allow me to explain. As we prepare to perform the royal ceremony, it turns out Heiss has taken advantage of us being distracted by Hugo and Protea. He's infiltrated the castle of Granorg's basement, where the ceremony happens, and cast his own sealing spell. This enchantment allows him to prevent the ritual from being used while he still lives. Now, if you're wondering how Heiss has access to such powerful magic, it's because he's been the holder of the Black Chronicle all along. He gave us the White Chronicle for yet indeterminable reasons, and also got in our way many times. Also confusing, but we'll get there. He's a mysterious guy. Reaching the chambers ourselves, we arrive just in time for him to tell us that he'll be in the ruins of the old empire to the west and blink away. Unfortunately, he decided not to blink away to an exciting dungeon layout-wise. It's more gray ruins, but the good news is these ruins have an interesting backstory. The old empire is the place from which the desertification spreads. You're also offered the benefit of heist just kind of randomly showing up as you make your way through and closing plot holes for you. So let's get some stuff out of the way. Stock is Ernst, the long lost brother of Erika. Heiss is his and Erika's missing uncle. Both Stock and Heiss share blood, but also they share one another's fate. Both men were intended to be sacrifices in the Ritual of Flux. It turns out when performing the ritual, both members will receive one of the Chronicles. The White and Black Chronicle are a set, and both books will allow their owners to travel through time. Heiss has used the book to stop his own sacrifice. And when I say stop, I mean he killed his brother, your father, and took his chronicle. The idea that for the world to keep going as is, innocent people need to die every couple of years doesn't sit right with Heiss. He's not wrong, that's pretty awful. The problem then, unfortunately, lies in Heiss's execution in pursuit of this ideal. Rather than want to change the world, he's chosen instead to ignore any good in it and destroy the whole thing. He feels that only Stock would be able to understand him given their shared fate. Unfortunately, he needed Stock to have a very particular life in order to understand their bond. So pretty much everything that led up to Stock getting the White Chronicle has been carefully hand-chosen by Heiss. Any timeline in which Stock died or didn't reach his potential Heiss would simply go back and start again. Part of the reason Heiss looks kind of old and unrecognizable to people like Erica is he has aged a great deal as he has reset time over and over again in order to get the perfect result. That result, of course, being stock in possession of the White Chronicle and able to use its time powers. With both men sharing a fate and the ability to manipulate time, this would allow Heiss's full dream to come to fruition. Both of them sitting together, watching the world end, this also means that any of the weird things like Rainy and Marco's mercenary crew being entirely destroyed by a monster was hand-engineered by Heiss. So despite being an antagonist to Stock this whole time, Heiss's intention was never to kill him. Which explains why he never just went back in time and finished the job. In fact, this was all to push him to use the power of the White Chronicle, and Heiss is delighted to see that Stock now has full control over the book. What Heist didn't account for was that Stock was going to actually become a more empathetic person thanks to using time travel. Thanks to being given an even broader view of the world with his powers, Stock sees the imperfections not as a part of its flaws, but its beauty. For every cruelty that the world has, there's also kindness and love. In fact, if a sacrifice is needed to protect this flawed but beautiful world, Stock would gladly shoulder that burden. Knowing that his original destiny was to be the sacrifice to save the world only cements his purpose. So this is a conflict of each man having a completely different worldview. Heiss seeing the world's flaws as unforgivable, and Stock seeing them as a path toward a better future. They will explicitly tell you that this is their differences in views in the upcoming fight in no uncertain terms. Subtext is for suckers, and in JRPG Town, we kill God and explain our themes at length. 
Anyway, the penultimate battle has arrived. Ice has lived an irregularly long life. The power of Flux has changed him drastically. But now we're on to the absolutely insane finale hours. Ice is going to battle us, and he's unsurprisingly very strong for an ancient old withered man. He even has these ancient tech cubes at his command. And as we all know, the more cubes you have, the more powerful you are. After fighting enough that Heiss realizes he might lose to the party he helped assemble, he flees back in time. More wounded than his physical form seems to be his emotional state. You can tell that he really wanted Stock by his side, hoping that someone would finally understand how he felt. Instead, Heiss feels more alone than ever before and betrayed by the one person he had hoped to find trust in. He seems intent to go back and alter history so that Stock might still want to side with him. He clings to the hope that someone will understand him even after coming to blows. And his shortcut plan is to kill Erica. In order to find exactly where he went, we will need to ask Lipti and Tio, the keepers of Historia. However, as per the rules of their world, they cannot expressly tell Stock where to go or what to do. They can make suggestions, and they do every time you get a bad ending. Believe me, they'll almost passive-aggressively tell you. They cannot, however, divulge information about a Chronicle Holder. I'm guessing this is Asimov's second law of magical children in time. Essentially, these two are constructs, remnants of the ancient empire's last sorcerer's soul. They are designed to guide each book's holder to the correct path in order to strengthen them for the sealing ceremony. Tio and Lipti are really creepy and weird, but in no way bad entities like I originally thought when I met them. In fact, they really can't do a whole bunch. Even if you abuse the power of the book like Heiss has been doing, they're really unable to do anything about it. It literally pains the twin to give any information pertaining to a holder. However, this seems to be a special case. Given the circumstances, the twins force themselves to supply stock with clues. So we manage to stop Heiss murdering Erica. Unfortunately, he immediately jumps through time again when you catch him. But while Stock has a moment with Erica, he tells her everything. That he is Ernst, her long lost brother that he wants to perform the ceremony to save the world, and that he is about to meet her for the first time very shortly. He asks her to keep this a secret from him so as not to change history. Not that that probably would have stopped him from doing it before, but whatever. I suppose this means all the weird blushing at the campfire near the middle of the game wasn't flirting, but I think it's just Erica having a bad poker face, or that's what I'd like to believe. We follow Heist further through time, and this allows us to unlock the game's final chapter, and the last dungeon as well. It seems Heiss has gone into the royal chamber where the sealing ceremony is held. With no more stock, his plans are dashed. Of course, to reach him, we have to go through the royal chambers, protected by ancient technology, which is, as we all know, shorthand for more cubes. It's more gray ruins for us. They add a mechanic here, though, that does mean you make a bridge with enemy corpses, which is kind of neat, but honestly, it doesn't do a lot to change my mind about the rather diminishing returns on this game's dungeon. But much like the others, it is a pretty short experience. It seems Heiss's plan is to merge everything into his own consciousness. If you can't get anyone to agree to watch the world end with you, a safe backup is to simply force them to watch it by absorbing them inside of yourself. An elegant solution for an elegant old man. I wanted to take note of this last battle because it uses some really inventive tactics right here at the end of the game. This final battle involves Heiss using the power of the Black Chronicle to fire out clones of himself where he will barrage us with high damage attacks. The Chronicle itself is actually immune to damage, and you'll need to stack clones on top of the book and hit them both in order to hurt it. But every time you clear all the clones out, the book summons more than last time. The battle is a fun balancing act of choosing when to clear out the damaging clones or use them as lightning rods to hurt the Chronicle. The game has a really solid battle system, and they flex these new gimmicks on you all the way to the very end. When we defeat the Black Chronicle and the clones, Heiss is finally laid low. He has nowhere left to run, so of course he decides then that the smart move is to absorb all of the hatred and negative emotions locked inside of the Black Chronicle. However, much like me at a pizza buffet, he thinks he can take it, but this is too much for him to handle. This creates a new, pretty scary amalgam called Apocrypha. A boss so big he's going to take up three screens to convey his scale and you have to fight all three screens upward to the top, wherein a horrible facsimile of Heiss's face is made of stonework. And yes, I know the word epic hardly means anything, but this fight is truly epic. Way to go, millennials, overusing that word. Oh, I'm millennials? Oh no! 
Apocrypha defeated, it's finally time to see the ending. In the original game, this can come in one of two forms. Of the myriad of side quests in this game, a number are more important than others. Thankfully, the Perfect Chronology Edition labels these quests conveniently with a key icon. Should you not complete all of the side quests required for the good ending, Heiss will be defeated and Stock and Erica will complete the ceremony. Heiss refused to be the sacrifice back in the day, because he couldn't think of anyone he cared for more than himself. But Stock isn't that kind of person. He cares enough about the people he's met on his journey to put his own life aside for their collective happiness. He takes on the mantle of sacrifice without hesitation, and we're treated to a big, full-blown epilogue that follows the lives of everyone Stock has helped. The more side quests you complete, the more hopeful a vision for the future this becomes. People learn to plant trees that can withstand desert conditions, characters you thought were dead manage to survive, and people in love get to end up with one another. But Stock's sacrifice isn't in vain. The people he loves carry on, albeit missing him, and help build the better tomorrow he wanted. Of course, if you complete all of the side quests marked with a key, you'll receive the original game's good ending. This is all the joy of the epilogue, but now marked with an additional postscript where Heiss and Stock chat in Historia before they shuffle off to the great beyond. Heiss sees what Stock did for the world and comes to the realization that he in fact was wrong. A little late, bro. This is something a little bit more than just a feeling though. The whole thing about not having anyone he cared for more than himself wasn't as true as he thought. Ice has always cared for one person more than himself, whether he'd admit it or not. And of course that person is Ernst, or Stock as we know him. He didn't want to watch the world end alone because he deep down couldn't bear the thought of a world without his beloved nephew. So in this way, Heiss asks Lipty and Tio if perhaps, rather than the sacrifice being stuck, could it be him? Sensing his innate desire to actually be the sacrifice and determination in his words, the twins reluctantly agree that his soul would be suitable. So Heiss ascends to complete the spell in Stock's stead, and he's given a glimpse of the future that Stock wants for the world. I see. So this is the future. You wish for. It's not bad. Stock is now free to see and help guide the future that he wanted. He can be alive for it. And while it still takes sacrifices of some kinds and the future is uncertain, he's able to help shape the world he wanted. Of course, desertification isn't solved, only held at bay once more. Assuming status quo holds true, then it'll be a generation or two until another soul is needed for the ritual, and it's here that the new content from Perfect Chronology is most interested. So with that in mind, let's go into some of the new content added in the 3DS edition. I brought up the more on the surface differences between the editions in the beginning, so let's touch on the more spoilery stuff while we're tucked away safely here in the plot synopsis. Now, I am aware that we went over this at the beginning very lightly, but I wanted to touch a little bit more on the mode select. At the outset of Perfect Chronology, you'll be asked how you'd like to experience the game's story. You can play the perfect mode, which will weave, somewhat seamlessly, the content I'm talking about into the narrative of the main game, or a pinned mode, which would present you the story in the way I've chosen to tell it for this recap. I would say if you're playing the game for the first time, despite what it warns you, that the perfect mode is the ideal way to experience the game. You'll be absolutely able to do all of the regular normal DS version content, and if you'd like, opt into the perfect chronology. While it works very nicely for a recap, splitting it up while playing the game doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. You can just stop at the ending we just saw and be A-OK. -okay. But for a pinned mode to work, you're going to need to do all that side content at once, and it just doesn't feel as good contextually when you compare it to how perfect mode plays out. Having all these new side quests given to you in one large chunk just doesn't feel as narratively satisfying. The Perfect Edition adds two expansions to the game, one of which is the Vault of Time. You know how when you go to the arcade and some of them make you buy that little card that you swipe and you can only use that money there at the arcade? That's basically the Vault of Time. While you're there, you'll be earning a special currency, and that special currency can unlock weapons, armor, and abilities. Like I mentioned earlier, cash in this game can be hard to come by for gear. This should give you some variety if you're not looking to just grind gold. And the gear is pretty powerful to boot. The far more impactful addition is the possible histories. 
And in order to get into that, we're going to have to introduce Nemesia. Nemesia is a time traveler, much like Stock and Heist, but her motivation is studying the desertification in order to put an end to it. She speaks in a very strange manner. There's no mistaking the feel of ancient magic. Yep, an A+. Yep, that's how she talks. I'm sure we all know someone who talks like this. Oh, no, no we don't. And I wish I could tell you what the story significance of her talking like this is. It just seems to be her weird quirk. You deserve an A+, Stock. Thanks. Mm, I guess you get an F. I'll give you a century of detention if you do. You've passed the first test with flying colors, Stock. Nemesi is a family of flowers, so no clues on the behavior there. I think the hope is this makes her sound smart and teacher-like, but sort of vibes more like a teacher having a mental break. She runs into Stock and immediately senses that he controls the White Chronicle. She clearly knows a lot about time travel. You'll also discover she mysteriously is known by Lipty and Tio as well. Her personality is bubbly and she has a tendency to put on a bright attitude even when talking about dour subjects. As you can see, her hat is also very big. Hey, future Cody here. It's two in the morning and I just realized she has a little Nemesia flower on her hat. So that's something that ties in in some way. Maybe this didn't need to be a side note. She, you will find, is the controller of a third book, The Red Chronicle. And this book has had its true power scattered across many possible histories or timelines that didn't come to be one of the main in Radiant Historia because of a little change here or there. These histories explore questions like, what if Marco never joined the military? What if Rosh became a full general? What if Noah was still alive and actually able to talk to his followers? All of these are touched on in the possible history. However, each of these histories has something wrong with it. This is thanks to the fact that the Red Chronicle has fallen apart, and its pages have scattered through space and time. Any possible history where one of the pages is present, it manifests itself into an artifact. These artifacts do not belong in their history, and therefore will change the world in different ways. Thankfully, Nemesia has a ship named the Dunamis, which is able to just kind of take us to these places to solve these problems. The way this works mechanically is you will be able to travel to the Dunamis's bow from Historia and select from a sizable number of missions. These are contextual to where the story is currently, so the more of the timeline you unveil, the more quests Nemesia will have on offer. More often than not, you'll find these to be very simple tasks. Typically, you will travel to a possible history, find the artifact, either fight it or pacify it through some other means, and then head back. The artifacts, thanks to their dimension warping power, can come in a myriad of forms, sentient shadow people, knickknacks, there's really not a limit. The one thing they all share is they don't belong where they've landed. They have so much power that they distort reality, making it absolute trouble that stock needs to fix. It's usually not hard to find the source of the problem because they tend to infuse whoever is unlucky enough to touch it with power and then corruptingly compel them to abuse said power. But once you've calmed the negative energy possessing the artifact, it goes back to a regular old page and you can return it to Nemesia to be added to the Chronicle. One of the problems I had with this content, however, is despite how much of it there is, I never felt particularly engaged when completing these activities. While the little bits of world building were incredible, most of the actual gameplay involved felt a little perfunctory to getting that information. I'm glad to get a little insight into Queen Protea, how she was once a woman of the people, or the Prophet Noah actually being kept alive for generations thanks to Thaumatech inside of his body? but it usually means a menial task needs to be completed for me to find this out. It's not a snooze fest or anything, but it does suffer at times for feeling a little like padding. In an ideal world for me, I'd probably want a little more lore on a few less side quests, but it's hard to say no to more content in a game world you like. The other main thing these new quests will do is tie up some of the more ambiguous or bittersweet story elements with a bit more of a tidy bow. And by tidy, I mean most everyone who seems to have some sort of bad ending gets some form of redemption in the post-game content. While not everyone gets a perfect fairy tale ending, it certainly scrubs some of the moral ambiguity from the original narrative. This is why, in my empirical checking, I found the new content to be a little divisive among fans. Given its critical reception and better sales, I think it would be a stretch to say this new content is hated but I do get the impression that some people find the perfect chronology, well, a little too perfect. And I understand. I don't know if characters like Hugo deserve redemption, it's tough to say. 
I think a capacity for forgiveness is important and it feels good to see the bad guy get a chance to actually make the world a better place. But I also think that unleashing weapons that turn dozens if not hundreds of people into sand in pursuit of your own power is, uh, and excuse me for my controversial opinion here, not a good thing to do. By far though, lore-wise, the biggest payoff of the new content is learning the history of the empire that preceded the game's story and finding out why exactly the world's turning into a desert. Apparently, much of this is hinted at in the art book, but Perfect Chronology goes ahead and makes this all absolute canon in-game. The Empire was really, really into Thaumatech. The final ruler over the Empire, Emperor Achilesia, pushed technology to the point where he led his people to a golden age. With this power, he gained control over Flux, and his engineers built three magical books. The Black Chronicle is what granted the ancient Empire its initial power, using time travel to bend the world to their will. The White Chronicle was made as a sister book, but also to keep the power of the Black Chronicle in check. The Red Chronicle, however, was made by the Emperor to conquer not only his timeline, but all known realities. He wanted to rule literally everything, forever. The problem with this was he was still, at the heart of things, a human and capable of being rather irrational. So when his daughter, the Princess, fell in love with a common-born Thaumatech engineer named Rodan, he flew into a rage. Deeming this man unfit for his daughter, he had the engineer imprisoned, tortured, and experimented on. Finally, the Emperor's most deranged experiment took the form of fusing the Scholar himself with the Black Chronicle. Predictably, this went very bad, shattering the man's mind and creating the Singularity. Not quite a phenomenon, not quite a person, and while they're able to get the Chronicle back, the Emperor could do nothing to stop the constantly growing power of the Singularity. So. With their kingdom crumbling from the immense power they created, the last remains of the Empire tried to seal it away. But the seal was not complete, and from the source it began to drain mana from the land, leaving everything in its wake turning to sand. Oh neat, we inherited the prior generation's problems. Descendants of the Empire would later come up with the Ritual of Flux, a spell designed to hamper the Singularity's immense drain on all life. And while she couldn't save her beloved, the princess managed to get away with the Red Chronicle, and that princess was Nemesia. And while her goal is to stop the desertification, selfishly a part of her wants to put Rodan out of his misery. Now she needs the power of all three chronicles combined to seal the beast off once and for all, which means Stock's going to need the power of the Black Chronicle, which means that Heiss gets a redemption arc too. You need to go to the moment in time where you defeat Heiss and convince him to try a third, better way of neither of them being sacrificed. Obviously, this is an ideal solution, so even though Heiss has doubts, he agrees to see this through. He's probably a lot easier to convince after we've proven how much stronger we are than him. Together, you all board the Dunamis, Nemesia's ship, and she powers it up with the Red Chronicle to give it juiced up time power, clearly represented by these wiggly lines that rotate around it. We now have a ship capable of piercing the time shell that the Singularity hides itself in. Oddly enough, Stock finds a seed on the ground when the Red Chronicle is restored, and he pockets it for later. Once you've completed all the side quests and assembled the Red Chronicle, Nemesia's plan can be put into action. Since the Singularity can exist at any point in time in any version of reality, both the Black and Red Chronicles will be needed to lock it in place. Nemesia will keep it from slipping into a potential history and Heiss will prevent it from slipping back and forth between their linear time. And while this happens, Stock will be tasked with sealing it once and for all. Sealing it, of course, is code for kicking its ass. The battle feels very, very final, because it is. The design on the singularity is, I mean, look at this thing. There's a lot going on here. Multiple heads, angelic god armor with what looks like it's from, maybe, Rezephon? Do you remember Rezephon? No, no one does? Huh. And the fight certainly lives up to its final status. You won't face multiple forms per se, but you go through several phases as you damage this boss. He even summons the corpses of the old emperor and empress to assist him. And then later when you expose whatever this is under his armor, you're only able to damage him when you reach certain combo numbers. Thankfully some of Gafka's side quests allow this number to go up exponentially, so thank you Gafka for helping me in this battle. It takes a rather large amount of effort, and the fight is surprisingly long if you're not prepared for some of the tricks it'll throw at you. It was another good moment for Radiant Historia making sure you've learned the lessons and fully understood the battle system. And after all the phases, eventually Stock and team will defeat the Singularity. Using all their chronicles to the extent that they have drains the power from all three books. 
The problem, though, is this is the same power that was keeping the dunamis afloat in this place outside of time. The ship begins to stand still, lacking the power to fly them home. With only a little bit of power left in her red chronicle, Nemesia chooses to use her remaining energy to send Stock and the others home. What's left behind is Nemesia and Rodan. With his powers now sealed, he goes back to being a normal man. Unfortunately, he's fallen into a coma. But this doesn't seem to upset Nemesia too much. She spent a lot of time away from the man she loved while he was sealed away as the singularity. And now, here, in this place beyond time, she can stay by his side and make up for lost time. The game gives us a one-year time jump. Now Stock is visiting everyone, checking in on all the happy endings we've spent so much time to help facilitate. Stock is helping heal relations between the demi-humans and humans. Marco quit being a soldier and got hitched. Rosh is a general, and Erica rules with a kind and fair hand over her kingdom, no longer burdened by the need to spill blood for the ritual. Stock, for his part, is married to Rainy, it seems like. The biggest change of all, though, is that plants are beginning to grow again at the Imperial Ruins. Thanks to Nemesia's efforts, the world can enjoy a brighter future, with actual hope for what's to come. As it happens, though, Nemesia is still alive in the void of time. She stands apart from time itself. So she sits there, in the darkness, next to Rodan's motionless body. But without the Singularity or the Red Chronicle, there's nothing she can do. She now has forever to spend by his side. I assume going crazy, but maybe not. She seems okay with it. In honor of her sacrifice, Stock has chosen to plant the seed that fell from the Red Chronicle. It feels like a fitting tribute to Nemesia. Of course, this is no ordinary seed and is a link between the White and Red Chronicles. The catch is there's no saying that the portal won't close when Stock goes through it, trapping him there as well. Luckily, everybody seems to be all in on Team Go Into Strange Portal, so it doesn't take any convincing at all. And of course, we find what I'm only assuming is a very bored Nemesia and Rodan together, standing at the end of time. Stock, despite having once been ready to give his own life to change the world for better, doesn't want Nemesia to have to do that for everyone. He's a different person than before. It seems this seed is born of the Red Chronicle's power, but is turned into something new altogether. A final, attainable history perhaps the most hopeful one possible. It's also powerful enough that Nemesia might be able to use this energy to get them back home. Of course, using seed as symbolism for a better tomorrow is a little bit cliche, but in this case, I let it go. Why not? I don't want her to sit in the void forever. That's terrifying. Instead, this seed is able to give the dunamis one last little push of juice and spring it back to life. You're right. Let's all go home together. Dunamis, set sail! Our destination? Is our world. Radiant Historia is a game that shines really brightly on the DS catalog. It's, uh, <laughs> Radiant. Whether it's the battle system that offers a puzzle-adjacent experience, or the dense storytelling fueled by an exciting take on time travel, Radiant Historia isn't afraid to try new things. This isn't just a feat for a handheld game, but stands as a unique experience within the genre, which is why it's such a shame to see a title like this get locked away from future generations by being stuck on the 3DS. Nothing about it really necessitates the use of two screens, so I'm hoping someday in the future, the game will get a remaster or re-release. Knowing the game's track record, you can probably expect this to drop approximately two days before the Switch 2. Of course, the game isn't perfect. It's hampered at times by things like using uninspiring dungeons, I would say egregious amounts of palette swapped enemies, and narratively a back half that does very little showing and a great deal of telling. And yes, I know many of these are issues with the hardware. You can only fit so much epic war story into that little 4 gigs. And perhaps because of that, there are still moments where I dream about what this would have looked like if it had been made for a console. I mentioned at the top of the video the growing pain for RPGs in Gen 7, but honestly, the genre is in a great place now thanks to those very experiments. We've gotten more smartly scoped games and more visual storytelling to take advantage of the medium. But for every moment I glazed over while running through another gray ruin in Radiant Historia, I was pushed ever toward the finish line. There's compelling writing and characters with actual stakes in the story, 
And I know my recap doesn't touch on every side story here. In fact, there's a wealth of character and interpersonal drama packed into this tiny little handheld game that I just had to pass on. Elm and Sonya are both pivotal characters, but they got cut for time on my recap. Time travel is used in this story to shift perspectives and create a great way to give you a sense of scope to a huge conflict, literally tearing a nation apart. Also excellently, it makes the way the story is told very unique to the medium of video games. If you watched a movie that jumped back and forth like this game does, you would melt into a puddle of confusion. But Radiant Historia uses the semi-linear storytelling and input from the player to make it very engaging. Most importantly, this is a game with something to say about life, sacrifice, and what it means to want to protect those you love. Yes, one person with a lot of power can create a lot of change, but at the end of the day, it's community and a sense of shared purpose that truly fixes the damage of desertification. However much I'd like it to be, changing the world isn't only about what we see in front of us. The world is a big place, and often we aren't granted the perspective in our personal lives to understand the power that a positive idea can have on a person or a community. Maybe a small choice you make today can end up being the seeds for change tomorrow. And yes, I'll go ahead and say that Perfect Chronology's ending was a little too perfect, but I think after 60 hours with all these characters, eh, they deserve a nice send-off. I don't have to think of it as canon if I don't want to anyway. I can just go by the original. No, no one's getting hurt here. It's just extra stuff. Someone might be getting hurt. I, someone might someone might have a vicious allergy to, to really happy, conveniently happy endings. All of this is to say, Radiant Historia is not perfect, despite the fact that it does have the word perfect in its name. But for the reasons I just outlined, I don't think this game means that much to this many people by mistake. Go ahead and check for lists of best DSRPGs and it'll usually show up. Not that that's necessarily a gold standard, but it's a start. It's an interesting and beautiful narrative, and I think a very good game. So if anyone asks, you can count me among the Radiant Historia fans. And that's all I got. Who knows? Like three months after I did my Star Ocean video, they announced a remake of Star Ocean 2. Perhaps I send some unique video game energy into the universe that helps, sir. Or it might just be that Star Ocean 2 is a classic and Square Enix didn't want to sit on money. We may never know the truth. I would play a Radiant Historia remaster though, Atlas. I'm just saying, nudge nudge. Either way, thank you so much for watching. And if you like this, uh, please feel free to leave a subscribe. It would be hugely appreciated. Not necessary, but hugely appreciated. And if you want little updates here or there or see stuff that I want to share early before my videos are done, I decided to open a free Patreon. I might add some paid tiers later, but for now it's just free. Just come hang out if you want, I guess. I'll have a link in the description. Anyway, bye!